So I've been wanting to make an iceberg video for a while now, but the problem being that pretty much every iceberg has been covered. I mean, Super Mario 64, Legend of Zelda, Lost Media. So the problem with me making this video is that I had to find one that hadn't been done before. And luckily I have. No one has done, as far as I'm aware, a Xenoblade Chronicles Iceberg. So I'm here to cover the Xenoblade Chronicles Iceberg. Note that this video will contain spoilers for the original Xenoblade Chronicles and a little bit of two. So if you have not finished those games, I uh, might not want to watch this video. Maybe it's not for you, but if you really don't care, you're welcome to stay around. This particular iceberg was made by a group of people on Twitter, which includes Espion Ken, Spellstone, Free Range Catboy, Nerdy Rambles, and Razor Appreciation Hours. Thank you for making this iceberg. And you all did a real good job with making this iceberg. I really like this iceberg. So every iceberg image has a scale as to how confident you are for your explanation. For this video, we will be using Shulk. You will see a definitive edition Shulk if I am very confident in my explanation. You will see we Shulk if I feel my explanation isn't the greatest and isn't the worst. And you will see Cursed Amiibo Shulk. If I'm not very confident in my explanation, I'm just making stuff up at that point. So let's get into it. With the tip of the iceberg. Bionis shoulder unused in the Wii version. This is talking about how there was one cut area in the original Xenoblade Chronicles, which was Bionis' shoulder. What we know, it was fully modeled and planned to be in the final game. It was simply just cut at some point in development. And if you've ever wondered why Magna Forest to Aerith Sea is so weird because of the whole water elevator thing, Bionis' shoulder was in between Magna Forest and Aerith Sea, so that was most likely the original intended way to get from Magna Forest to Aerith Sea, but they cut it so they had to make the whole water elevator thing. But luckily, in Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, we got Future Connected, which takes place on the Bionis' shoulder, so we finally got to play it after all these years. Monado, Beginning of the World. This is simply just the original name of Xenoblade Chronicles when it was first being developed. But they changed it to Xenoblade because they wanted to have the, the Xeno in the name because, you know, Xeno Gears, Xeno Saga, Xenoblade. Dunban's photo of Bionis' shoulder. Yeah, Dunban just has a picture of Bionis' shoulder in his house. It's never explained, no one brings it up. Maybe he just went to Bionis' shoulder someday and was like, hey, this is pretty neat and took a picture and took it home. Zord is Desiree's father. Okay, so if you've played the story of Xenoblade, you know that Zord was a faced mech on. You fought him in Colony 6 in the Aether Mine, and, well, he died. <laughs> Later on, you can meet a character uh, named Desiree in Colony 9. After you do some quests for to get one of Shulk's skills, she revealed that her father's name was Zord. And it's highly implied that this Zord and Mechon Zord were the exact same person. The symbol on the Monado in the loading screen means reading. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you boot up the game, the little symbol that the Monado has means reading. It's the kanji for reading. Alvis's key necklace. So Alvis had a key necklace in the original Xenoblade Chronicles, but in Definitive Edition, it was changed to an Aegis core crystal. Which leads into Xenoblade Chronicles 2, because in case you didn't know, uh, there's three Aegises. You have the Numa Core, which became Pyra and Mithra. You have the Logos Core, which became Malos. And then you have the Ontos Core. We never meet Ontos, and the architect even states that he doesn't exist in the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 universe anymore. He's in a whole nother reality. So the theory was that Alvis is on toast, and this is pretty much nodding to that fact. Shulk doesn't actually eat the sandwich. Yeah, if you... <laughs> in the scene in Outlook Park at the beginning with Shulk and Fiora, where she brings him lunch, and he's eating a sandwich, he doesn't eat it, he just motions it towards his mouth. It's really good. Ricky is actually a good father. Well, yeah. I mean, he goes out, he protects his kids, he raises them well. He goes out and gets money to raise them. Provide for him? Yeah, he's a really good dad. Uh, Dixon and Alvis is 100% beatable gems. Yeah, how did they get those 100% unbeatable six gems? Because 
as far as I'm aware, you can't craft them. They're impossible to craft, and they're extremely powerful. I don't know how they managed to get them. Unique monsters respawning after being killed. Okay, so I kind of forgot this one while I was recording, but here we go. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense for unique monsters to respawn because they actually act more like mini-bosses. And they won't respawn for a while, but they will respawn eventually. Though I guess the reason they respawn is, as a gameplay mechanic, some of these monsters are the only source of certain materials, so it'd be kind of mean of the game to screw you out of certain items because a monster only ever spawned once. Memory Space is the name of the final area. The final area is indeed named Memory Space, and I think it's supposed to reference the fact that it was created by a computer, that the Holding Up by One universe was created by a computer. So, Memory Space, it, it's a pun, get it? Because it's Memory Space because it's the, it's the memory of space, and you even travel through space. At least that's what I interpret it to be. Gnostic themes. I have no idea what this means. Something about an inferior creator god. I tried looking it up and I couldn't find a for dummies explanation, so mm, forgive me. There's a couple of things I'm not going to be able to tell you about. So I looked up and there was a GameFAQ thread on Gnosticism and Xenoblade. Uh, I'm not going to go through it because I'm still confused by it, but if you want to read on it, uh, it does exist. There is threads in the world. I don't feel confident in my ability to explain what Gnosticism is and how it relates to Xenoblade because I was never one to pick up on subtle themes in anything, especially if it involves religion. Ryan is afraid of spiders and was almost killed by one in Tephra Cave. Yeah, Ryan, it's revealed in a heart-to-heart -heart that Ryan has arachnophobia. He was almost killed by the Arachno Queen in Tephra Cave when Shulk and Ryan are traveling through it. Moving the camera during cutscenes. Yeah, if you move the camera, a lot of things tend to go wrong. <laughs> Usually anything that's not supposed to be in view of the camera, it's not there, it's unloaded. So you lead, it leads to stuff like how in Sword Valley there's green lasers flying everywhere, but no one's shooting them. You can find a lot of these videos online about how moving the camera messes with Xenoblade. The Aether Mind's magical ability to drain a player's motivation to play the game. Yeah, Aether Mind's is probably the worst area, I'm gonna be real with you. I, I <laughs> There's just something about the Aether Mind's. It's like Wet Dry World from Super Mario 64. Every time you get to that area, you start just saying, why does this area exist, and why do I hate it? Eggle's reconstruction of the Mechonis' left arm. If you played the game, you would have known that the Bionis chopped off the uh, Mechonis' left arm, uh, which became the fallen arm. But if you look at Mechonis, you can still see it has two arms. It's explained later by an NPC that Eggle had the left arm reconstructed. That's why it's there. Bana's drug trade. Yeah, Bana, or Bana, Bana. Bana has a whole drug trade with red pollen orbs and stuff. It's a side quest you can do in Magna Forest. And uh, he's got a big old dinosaur. He's got a Terex because you gave him a Terex egg. I don't know why you would do that. He's selling those red pollen orbs to the high end, yo. The black wreckage is Mumcar's remains. Well, yeah. <laughs> Mumcar's uh, and Metalface get stabbed by this giant piece of rubble right outside Galahad Fortress, they fall down to the fallen arm and you find the wreckage of Metal Face. So yeah, it is, it's Mumcar's remains. Shulk with two Monados and the Colony 6 tutorial. I still cannot find anything on this. Uh, from what I've seen in, in the threads on Twitter, apparently in the original Wii version during the Colony 6 reconstruction tutorial, you can see Shulk with two Monados. I don't know what this is I, I tried looking in the original Wii version, I couldn't see it in the tutorials, so I, if someone has a picture of it, I, 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 I wanna see it. Shulk doesn't actually have a sense of taste, yeah. So I looked this up and I found the heart to heart, Fiora's cooking, in which Ryan and Fiora discuss Shulk's sense of taste. And Ryan puts it this way to Fiora, you know, if you're eating good food all the time, it must taste completely normal to Shulk. And he probably thinks all other food is pretty horrible. That's why his sense of taste is so messed up. So it could be theorized that since Fiora is just making all this good food for Shulk, he just thinks it's normal. 
And that's probably why he doesn't have a good sense of taste. Mumkar's razor. This is a very rare material that you can only obtain over trading with Kurolf while he's on Valak Mountain during the quest Adventurers in Peril. It is the only way to get Mumkar's razor. It's not a collectible, it's not used in anything, and it's just weird. Ricky was made hero pawn to pay off his debt. This explains itself, I mean, he literally became the hero pawn to pay off his debts to the village. That It's explained in the story. Dixon's unused jumping animations. So Dixon has jumping animations, but he's never in a position where you can jump with him, especially since he's not playable. Uh, and you can't leave the green areas to go jump off a cliff with him, so it just goes unused. You can't retreat if you were to seize the future. This message only appears in the Battle of Sword Valley at the prologue. If you somehow manage to get out of the green barrier and just run away far enough, that message will appear. But I don't know how you're supposed to get it to appear because you can't escape that barrier in Sword Valley. Zanza couldn't see any farther into the future because he couldn't see past his death. Yeah. Okay, so this is towards the end of the game where Zanza, he's in memory space. He's trying to see the future, but he can't see anything. It's supposed to allude to the fact that he dies. He couldn't see any further because he couldn't see beyond his own death. Alvis's Claymore is a recolored junk sword. Yeah... If you look at the junk sword that Shulk starts with in Alvis's Claymore, it's just a silver version of Shulk's junk sword. The Monado Expedition. So about 14 years prior to the beginning of the story, Shulk, his parents, and a bunch of other, other people went on an expedition to Osai Tower in Valak Mountain. There they found the Monado sealed in Osai Tower. Zanza got released and absorbed the life force of everyone there, including Shulk. Then Zanza inhabited Shulk, and he allowed Shulk to live, so he brought Shulk back to life. And then Dixon finds Shulk and the Monado there, and he brings them to Colony 9. Where does the party store all the collectibles and materials? Same place where every RPG party stores all of their materials. In their pants. Can't say I feel so good about deceiving these kids. This is a line that Dixon says in Satoral Marsh uh, when he leaves with a Thauron and Juju. This is supposed to foreshadow that eventually he will betray the group, and he does. What did Juju use the bugs and animals for in Colony 6 Reconstruction? Yeah, I need an explanation for this too, because how is he taking bugs and animal pelts and making water towers out of that? It's never explained. You need the weirdest items for con reconstruction. You need beans to reconstruct something. What is he using the beans for? Melia was 68 when Sorian became emperor. Yeah, Melia's pretty old. She's actually the oldest party member. Yeah, Ricky, <laughs> Ricky being 40? Yeah, he's not the oldest. Melia is. She's 88. Uh, so it would have been 20 years ago uh, Sorian became emperor. Hyentians, they age differently compared to Homs, even though Melia is half Homs. Uh, she still has the whole aging slower thing. Ancient Daidala is stronger than Yaldabaoth. If you played the story, you would have met, uh, you obviously would have met Egil and his mech on Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth is about level 70 when you fight it. Ancient Daidala is a level 100 and, I believe, 5 unique monster on the Fallen Arm. It's a super boss, and it's stronger than Yaldabaoth. Egil claims that Yaldabaoth is the strongest mech on ever built, even though Ancient Daidala is level 105 compared to Yaldabaoth's level about 70. Uh, I know you're probably wondering, hey, we're only halfway through the iceberg, why are we stopping here? And that's because uh, I use iMovie to edit these videos, and iMovie does not like when I edit anything over 15 minutes. Every time I edit a video that's like over 15 minutes long with pictures and sound, the video just ends up getting corrupted. The movie just starts glitching because it just doesn't like when I do that. So I'm just cutting it here. I'm gonna make a part two which covers the second half of the iceberg. So if you want to see that when it comes out, uh, you can subscribe. I'm not going to force you. Unless you want to subscribe. And that'd be cool. Might get an Oreo if you subscribe. But I never know what might happen. Uh, but I will be making the second part of the iceberg. So, uh, 
I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'll see you guys next time for the second half of the iceberg.